Welcome, everyone, and once again, we'd like to enter into a word of prayer. Before we do begin, we'd like to ask those who are present, who are able, let us kneel. Holy Sabbath. Our gracious Father, who art in heaven, with anxiety and a determination to be grounded in thy message, I ask for your grace upon thy servant, that as I am reading and teaching, I am directed by you, that my ears may be directed by you, that I may hear thy small, still voice, that you may correct me and guide me, and bring to my remembrance what thou hast prepared me for this evening, this morning. When we enter into thy holy Sabbath, you may bless us and sanctify us and make us holy. And we claim your promises in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11, Ezekiel chapter 20, and verse 12. Sanctify us for thy mercy's sake, Yeshua. We ask for your blessings for those who are viewing and present with us. Help us to grow in this message. And may your people grow. Help us to reach a million people. And may your people have a desire to evangelize the word. In the name of Yeshua we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let us open to our key texts. We also like to share with one another that you may... Call 540-370-1844. You may email 7danielrevelation at gmail.com. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome that you may worship with us. And we thank to we thank to say we'd like to see new faces. Our topic, the time of trouble began in 1846. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 14. <clears throat> and we will begin with verse 9. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. <clears throat> it is for the interest of all to understand what the mark of the beast is and how they may escape the dread threatenings of God. Why are men not interested to know what constitutes the mark of the beast and his image? It is in direct contrast with the mark of God. Exodus 31 verses 12 to 17. Our scripture text is as follows. Stay with me as we guide ourselves into this message and most of all we can continue to grow and be a people once again. 
as we look at these studies, we also want to understand what Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 to 11 meant and means today. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice. This loud voice is this addition that is coming, which is the loud cry, which supports the third angel's message. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Number one, worship the beast is referring to Catholicism. His image is referring to Sunday worship. His mark is placed in his forehead or in his hand in communion service Ash Wednesday on Sunday when they partake of a false abomination communion service. Number two, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Number three, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Therefore, for everyone that's been dying, ladies and gentlemen, have you either received the mark of the beast or have received the seal of Yahweh? I hope you understand this premise. In other words, if they have violated the Ten Commandments, therefore there is no choice but to cast them out because they kept not the commandments nor had the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those who have the seal of Yahweh and have died off are sealed in the book of life, in the book of remembrance. Their judgment, their probation has ended. The time of trouble began in 1846 AD. In reading, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to pause for a few seconds in a very important key point that I will read to us. And I will make it more plainer <clears throat> as I share with us this morning. Many of you have lost churches. Many of you have donated millions of dollars and thousands of dollars in regards to building a church, uh, buying a property, etc. But because it has the name the Seventh-day Adventist Church of blank, 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 Tennessee or blank, 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 uh, California, it belongs to the Seventh-day Adventist Corporation. You didn't know that. You didn't know that and it wasn't uh, discussed with you in the committees of your committee meetings in the churches, in the local churches. This was dated March 12, 1907. And I do have a copy of that if anybody would like a copy, okay? In reading, the Adventists of the West End met at the tabernacle again last night and talked over their church troubles, and there was many, with the result that announced today that matters are pretty well patched up and things will progress for a while longer. In the same old way, it is probable that the new corporation, the new church corporation, will be formed. Now, now listen, this phrase, the new church corporation, was discussed March 12, 1907. It's not something that just happened, okay? Will be formed, but in acting but in acting and acting by laws, the theological test is to be left out so that it can be possible in the future as in the past for a member of the local church to believe or disbelieve in the prophecies of the indemontable, which is impossible to subdue or defeat. Indomitable, that's the definition, impossible to subdue or defeat. Okay. The shame at first in the forming of the new corporation was to work into it by laws a religious test that would exclude the anti-white element and thus enable the delivery of the church property into the hands of the general conference. Steps were taken to prevent this by injunction if necessary, but the necessity has been abandoned. This, ladies and gentlemen, is being used today in all the churches all over the world. So if you donate money and you want to build a church and you want to have it built in Silver Springs, Maryland and you want to call it the Seventh-day Adventist Church of Silver Springs, Maryland, that poor committee no longer owns that church. It belongs to the corporation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church because you put the name Seventh-day Adventist Church on those papers. Okay? 
So this is a way to understand what has happened. You see, pastors and evangelists are stocks, or let me say real estate agents. That's what they are. They bring in money into the corporation. And if people don't come in, they're going to be moved in another location in a different job where they can do other things that are more suitable. But they're going to bring in a person that can be able to call in people to the denomination and teach them false doctrines, new theology. Now, what this is saying is that <clears throat> and acting the bylaws, the theological test is to be left out. In other words, no more teaching of the commandments, the prophecies, etc. is to be left out. Okay? And this has happened already. Continuing, when a prophet speaks, inspiration, the 1882 great controversy was redone, and this book is not correct. Okay, for those of you that didn't know, there is an 1882 great controversy, and we do have them. Now, number two, the 1858 great controversy is a correct book. There is nothing wrong with this book. The, in uh, the year 1882, 1945, early writings was copyrighted, which is a corrupt book, and changed the prophecies totally. Do not depend on this book. You can depend on the 1858 great controversy. In like manner, I'd like to share a few key points that the prophet consistently used as she would speak and inform the people in her time as well as today what our Savior had shown her. For example, in like manner, others rejected it, rejected the writings in the 1858 Great Controversy. Inspiration, A, she says, I saw. Inspiration, B, I was shown. The Lord showed her. Elohim showed her. Inspiration. See, I have been shown. You notice that she's always saying, saw, shown, and shown or been shown. Okay? This is very important. So that you will understand her consistencies in the writings. When you're reading these books that have been compiled, you will read books in a paragraph, in a sentence, or pages, or chapters. But there is no biblical scripture or there is no reference where it came from. That is letting you know that it is the writers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the editorial department, the management departments, that have inserted these inf this information. Okay? Continuing. Let me speak a little bit about time prophecies. In the year 677 B.C., Babylon began to rule and they ruled 140 years. However... Seventy years were given to the Hebrews. This was first to their captivity of the Hebrews, 490 years. Okay? Now, 70 weeks, referring to 490 years. Now, I'm giving you these dates in regards to time prophecies and what they all mean for your learning and your understanding. Okay? So, in 677, Babylon rose. The 70 year captivity, it refers to the Hebrews, 490 years. In the year 607, Daniel chapter 1 was written, in other words, dictated. Therefore, when we get 70 of the captivity of the Hebrews and 677 from Babylon, and you subtract it, it gives you 607. In 607, the prophecy of Daniel chapter 1 was written. Can I hear an amen? This is what it means. Now, no zero year. You do not begin with a zero year. That's where you'll find some problems like many others have encountered. Now, therefore, let us go to the 2520 and the 2450. Things happen in the 2520 and things happen in the 2450. Now, the 2520 is the longest prophecy, okay, beginning from 723 to 1844. The 2450, subtracted from the 2520, refers to 70 years of the Hebrews captivity, which is located here in this formula. See, we have to understand what these dates mean, all these numbers mean. So you will understand why it's written inside the books or why someone is discussing it. Okay? Number three. Let's take the 2520, which is the longest prophecy, and subtract it from the rise of Babylon. And 677 brings us to 1843. Christ didn't come. They were studying, and while they were studying, they were only observing the sliver of the new moon to begin the month. They were still amateurs. They were just beginning. They were Bible students. 
But then they finally understood as Samuel S. Snow went and studied with the Karaite Jews for many, many years and days. He understood that we had to comprehend the barley harvest in the month of Abib and united with the sliver of the new moon. After comprehending the Moedims and the feast of the Jewish or the Hebrew people, then he applied it along with the rest of the group, William Miller and all the other associates. He was only given this message. And then from there, for some time, you can't trust him any longer because he kind of deviated. However, our Savior used him and gave him information to give to the people in preparing for the second coming. Therefore, what he understood was that Christ was coming and that William Miller put the date 1844 and began to prepare. In that year, ladies and gentlemen, they had received the latter rain. They were empowered to preach the message of the first, second, and third angel's message, and by 1846, they were already in their way and given the message after the disappointment two years later. Therefore, what occurred here, ladies and gentlemen, is to occur again, again but in bigger measure. Ten times much. Now, what I'd like to share with you once again, the 2520's longest prophecy, and it began in 723 B.C. It ended in 1844. Judgment. That's the Day of Atonement, which is a Moedim. It's a feast. It ended. In 677, Babylon began to rule for 140 years, and it fell to Medo-Persia. And Medo-Persia fell to Greece, and Greece fell to paganism and Rome. So as we subtract 677 from 2520, it gives us 1843, disappointment, Christ didn't come. And you do not use, there is no zero year, time prophecies. Time prophecies. Let's begin with another formula. We're going to get 607 when Daniel chapter 1 was dictated by Daniel. And divided, or excuse me, subtracted from the 2450, brings us down to 1843. Please do not use zero year, no zero year. However, prophecy started in October 22nd, 1844, which is the seventh month of Tishri. Tishri. The computation of time was B.C. 4, Yeshua's birth. And by the way, for those of you who are viewing, I want to emphasize is that you can view these studies on the birth of Yeshua and what does the Bible say about the new moons that is out on YouTube for your understanding your education and your references with scriptures which are all correct. The birth of Yeshua when it began, the Bible tells us. In Adventist home, there's a chapter stated there, as me and my wife were once looking at it and our son, where it states that the Bible, you know, the pastors know when Christ was born. It doesn't tell us. Well, that's a lie. The Bible tells us when he was conceived and when his birth took place. Both John the Baptist and Yeshua. Can I hear an amen? Johanan, when he was conceived, when he gave birth. Okay? Let us continue. Number one, 30 years of age. At 30 years of age, three and a half years later, which was number two, 33 years of age, when he was crucified. Your reference is found in Lectures on the Principles and Doctrines, page 63. There is more on this, but I don't want to overwhelm you because then you, it would just give you a lot of confusion. So we're going to take it step by step. So Christ, B.C., was four. Yeshua's birth. His birth was on the Feast of Tabernacles, the Moedim of Tabernacles, on the 15th day of Tishri. On the 8th day, he was named by, the, uh, by Gabriel, the angel, who told Mary to name him Yahushua. On that same day, on the 8th day of Tishri, the week of Tabernacles, on the eighth day, he was circumcised under the Nazarite vow. Take note. Under the Nazarite vow. <clears throat> Let us discuss the 1888 Great Controversy, page 611, Final Warning. We do carry that book, which is, has 286 pages added to it. Now, it is not dependable, it is not worthy to use this information because man inserted the information. Now what they did here, they inserted in the chapter final warning, when in reality it's the loud cry, okay? And they changed this chapter, so you will be finding it on page 611. 
Now let us discuss the 1884 Great Controversy, page 429 and 430. Take note. But these are to be far exceeded by the midnight movement, excuse me, by the mighty movement, under the loud cry of the third message. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost, Feast of Weeks, to Moedim. The message will be carried as was the midnight cry of when? Of 1844. Not so much by argument, there's not going to be no more argument, as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. What is it saying? What it's saying that prior to 1844, they were preaching the first, second, and third angels' messages, ladies and gentlemen. This message went out to the whole world in 10 weeks. In 10 weeks, there was a disappointment in 1843. They had to restudy, understand the Moedims, the feast. That's why you have the eighth month, uh, seventh month movement. This is why there's been so much confusion. Is because your church officials, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, just distorted all the messages to the core so that it can correlate with Sunday beliefs. Sunday beliefs. Stay with me. A, the loud cry, and take note. I'm going to give you some information. A, the loud cry is not the finality warning of the third angel. It joins it. Gives more power to it. Christ does this. B, the loud cry is not the finality warning of the third angel. Take note. It's not the finality. C, the loud cry joins it. The third angel in Russian 14, verses 9 through 11, which is our key text. D, mighty movement far exceeded. In other words, this movement is going to far exceed everything that took place in the past. Okay? And back then it was far exceeded. E, the message will be carried as was the midnight cry of 1844, not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. Your reference is the 1884 Great Controversy, page 429 and 430. Now, I want to ask a question. Where was the church organization? There wasn't none. It did not exist. So Pastor Stephen Bohr says, Oh, we weren't part of the Advent movement. Oh, yes, we are. Big time. Stephen Bohr is trying to separate two key components, the Advent movement and the Seventh-day Adventist Church that's corrupt to the core, where the scriptures tells us that it goes into the Laodicean state and doesn't take us home. Did you know that it was already written down in the books, early writings, also in the 1858 Great Controversy? And let me share with us just quickly here, to get a, before I get on the tantrum. These two books, and excuse me for how they look, but this is the original book, 1858. This is early writings which is corrupt to the core to lead you to hell. And I say this deliberately to get your attention. Excuse the language. This book has so much air in it, you have no idea, and you buy it, and you use it for $15.95, and it's leading you safely, comfortably in the churches, and you're not doing anything but staying in the Laodicean state. On page 107, it tells us exactly, it's written in there, it's written in here, that the Seventh-day Adventist church is in the Laodicean state and never comes out. The messages have already been given. So why are you still in the Seventh-day Adventist Church reading the new information of an organization that rewrote the writings of Ellen White and rejected her as the prophet of the messenger and rejected, accepting the Pope as the Antichrist, they rejected this. You need to get the correct book. This book, you need to hold on to it so you can make your comparisons. So the question was asked, where was the church organization? There was none. It didn't exist. There was no denomination when this message was being given. There was no denomination under a 501c3 when this message was given prior to 1844. There was no organization. The same that occurred then, ladies and gentlemen, is going to occur now and to the end. There is not going to be no church organization whatsoever. No Seventh-day Adventist church. It is totally a new world order that is going on that train like wildfire and the conductor is Satan. 
and he's got the whole world on board. It's time to come out, read the correct messages, and get on board and get on that road that's going to the kingdom. Yeshua is the head of that road. Question, or may I say, where was the church organization when the midnight cry was given in 1844? It did not exist. It was faithful people that studied the books and understood. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, it, all of that you see on the screen here is applying to them. Let us begin. 1851 Christian Experience and Views, laid the same message was applying to the church before it was organized. Prophecy, it's been fulfilled. Number two, early writings, page 107. Laodicean church described their past, no, described their present condition perfectly. And here's the reference that Yeshua gives. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 20, Laodicean. They are neither cold nor hot. From review of June 10, 1852, is when they went into the Laodicean state. Five Testimonies, page 136, which is correct. To stand in defense of the truth and righteousness, this is the test, is the Sabbath. Ten Commandments. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church are responsible for changing all the books of Alan G. White. Everything. Everything. Now if I can get a view here. I like to walk here. And show... A few books, if I may. All these books that you see on the shelf, the second shelf here, are all books. Of, they have compilation and books of a new order. Conflict of the Ages, Testimonies, Volumes 1 to 9. The books that are up here are correct. They're all correct. And what they did from these books, they turned around and rewrote everything and compiled it into these books. That's what they did. This is the Philadelphia message, not the Laodicean message. Time prophecies. Number one, the 2520 is the longest prophecy. The 2300 day year prophecy in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, verse 14. Under 2300 days shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So when we do, uh, subtract 2300 from the 2520, it gives us 220 years. Number two, 677, Babylon began to rule, as I shared earlier. The 220 refers to years, equals 457, with the 20, with the 2300 day year prophecy beginning in 457 BC, Ezra chapter 6. This is the multiplication, ladies and gentlemen, in time prophecies. Number three, the 2300 years refers to time prophecy. Subtracted from the 457 gives you 1843. Christ didn't come. So all of these numbers, ladies and gentlemen, refer to dates. All of these, and this is time prophecy. Can I hear an amen? Now you know the story. I then saw the third angel, said my accompanying angel, Fearful is his work. Awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares. That third angel was found in our key text that we read this morning, Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. That's the key text. Fearful is his work. Awful is his mission. He is the angel. What's it say? He is the angel that is to select the wheat, the righteous, the gold, from the tares, Laodicean, wicked. And seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. These things should engross the whole mind, the whole attention. Now, uh, in the Battle Creek letter, page 63. At this time, comma, the gold is separated from the dross in the church. So what's it say up here? The third angel, he is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares. Okay? and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garden. So in the letters, Battle Creek letters, we also got other manuscripts. 
And Testimonies, Volume 5, page 20 to 98, are the Battle Creek letters in that book. However, on page 63, it states, in parentheses, In this time, comma, the gold, referring to the Seventh-day Adventist Christians, who are pure and holy and obedient, are separate from the dross. The dross refers to the other Christians, Seventh-day Adventists, who stay in the church. They stay in the church, the dross. In this time, comma, the gold is separated from the church. This is the correct stating. This is what it's saying. You might be offended, but don't get offended. You're getting the truth. Now it's time for you to do something and wake up and come out of your slumbers. Your reference is from the Supplement to the Christian Experience and Views, page 38, 1854 edition, which is correct to the core. I then saw the third angel, said my accompanying angel, fearful is his work, awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. These things should engross the whole mind, the whole attention. Early writings, page 118. First printed, 1882. Second printed, 1945. Copyright, air. Why is it an air? Because what they did here is that, and seal or bind, there's no comma. In the early writings, they put a comma. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19, you do not add and you do not subtract, or you shall receive the seven last plagues. Can I hear an amen? This is is what separating the wheat from the tares began in 1846. Number one, in 1846, separating the wheat from the tares, this is when it began. Why? Because the first angel's message, the third, second angel's message, the third angel's message was already being given, and it was time now for the separating because Christ had entered from the holy place into the most holy of holies. This is why there will be a partial resurrection, which is found in 1858 Great Controversy, page 205. In Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11, is when it started. It was selecting the wheat from the tares, is the third angel. Fearful is his work. Why? Because he's selecting and sealing the righteous and separating them from the wicked. Question, when did the third angel's message start? A, B, about 1846, that's when it started. The separating. 1858 Great Controversy, page 205. That's why we have a partial res resurrection. However, they distorted in the 1884 Great Controversy to the core, which are nine heirs in that book only. Plagiarism started many years ago before all this began, ladies and gentlemen, even before Ellen G. White was born. Plagiarism was already on the rage of occurring. Old Excuse me, Original Testimonies, page 26, page 11. Spirit of Prophecy speaks only truth, referring to her original writings and books. 1911 Great Controversy, we will do a comparison. As I shared earlier, page 628, these plagues are not universal, or the inhabitants of the earth would wholly be cut off, would wholly cut off. So many of the Sunday Adventist men and women, pastors, are saying, the plagues are not universal, that, and they leave it there. They're not universal. They're not universal. It's because they're reading from a corrupt book that was prepared and done and added and assisted by W.W. W. Prescott, Vice President of the General Conference, Willie White, Mary, Mary White, his wife, Haskell, Uriah Smith. These are the individuals and others that were involved in preparing and revising the 1911 Great Controversy that has 168 pages omitted and rewritten and inserted in order for you to have the 1911 Great Controversy. So when you read letter 56 and it says 1911, they use that phrase to correlate and support the 1911 Great Controversy when in reality Alan White is talking about what happened in the past of writing the Great Controversy which is now being discussed in the year 1911. That's what Alan White was referring to. Those studies, ladies and gentlemen, they're out on YouTube for your education and your preparation to develop the character of Christ and understand the correct messages of the Philadelphia Church. Question, are the seven last plagues universal? I want to ask that question again. Are the seven last plagues universal? Yes, they are. They're universal. Everything dies. Animals, insects, everything in the oceans. 
Everything that's fly, even the wicked human beings. Because the first plague is source, pain. Everything dies. Absolutely, the seven last plagues are universal. But in the 1900 Great Controversy, it says these plagues are not universal. And they changed it. Let's hear the correct matter. 1850 Great Controversy, page 211. The plagues occur all over the world. Everything is dead. There's your reference. You can read the whole chapter. 1850 Great Controversy, page 198 and 199. Number one, it was impossible for the plagues to be poured out while Jesus officiated in the sanctuary, number one. However, when he leaves the sanctuary, number two, the plagues were falling upon the inhabitants of the earth. Plagues, sores, hell, darkness, and death occur. Inhabitants refers to all the human beings from the beginning of time to the end, all the wicked. And those that are living the wicked are the inhabitants that will receive the just desserts of his wrath. Eighteen eighty four Great Controversy, page two seventy six. Through the great powers controlled by paganism, focus my brothers, paganism and the papacy, two systems, okay? This is the fourth empire, this is the fifth empire symbolized by the dragon, the devil, and the leopard-like beast, Satan for many centuries destroyed God's faithful witnesses. A. For a thousand years slash 260 years, the papacy was prevented from becoming an empire, a business. Church and state came together. And it existed more than 1260 years. More. And let me share it. I will show you a diagram. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I want to share with you a few key points. Today is the time to understand these prophecies where we are at. And I want to share it this way, and I will go slow so that you can write it down. Because it's not going to be on the screen. The first empire, we understand, was the Tower of Babel, where all the languages were changed. And number one, it was changed because they were not evangelizing the character of Christ. So he had to change the characters and stop what they were doing and disperse them. And out of that came the Hebrew people. Okay? Now, let me share number one. The first empire is Babylon. Babylon fell to Medo-Persia. Number three, Greece. The Grecian Empire with Alexander the Great. The fourth empire is Paganism Rome which I will be sharing here with us in the slide. It's a diagram. The fifth empire is Papal Rome. Papal Rome. The sixth empire is Atheistic Communism, 1917, 1898. In that transition, France was in uproar. They denied the existence of Yahweh, God, and they rejected him. Those two witnesses is the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they burned the books from every location that they would find them. And they tortured and killed the people that had the Bible. From France's atheistic views, it transitioned to communism. That was the USSR. It fell, this is the sixth head, it fell in the year of 1989. Okay, that's the sixth one. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are transitioning to church and state. Church and state is the image which will come together and form La Dato Si Sunday Law. The first phase has already occurred. It's already been fulfilled. Sunday has already been passed in the United States and in the world. The whole world is in the Sunday worship state mentality. They are receiving the mark of the beast as I stand here right now. And those that are keeping the commandments of Elohim and have his testimony and are understanding what is taking place are receiving and have the seal of Yahweh on their forehead and on their hand. Why? It's because they partake of the week of unleavened bread, the communion service. The unleavened bread is the sign and seal. As 
It's on the forehead, Sabbath, and it's in your hand, unleavened bread. This is what's occurring. The reset program is already on. Number two. 19th great controversy, 439. In chapter 13 is described another beast, like unto a leopard, to which the dragon gave his power and his seat and great authority. This symbol, as most Protestants have believed, represents the papacy, which succeeded to the power and seat and authority once held by the ancient Roman Empire. What they did here, ladies and gentlemen, in 1911, is that they changed it from its correct premise. This is the correct view in the 1884 Great Controversy. Okay? Let me continue. Here's the diagram that I want to share with us. The Fourth Empire began to establish after the Grecian Empire that rose in the year 332 BC. That was the Grecian Empire. And transitioned and fell to the Fourth Roman Empire, which was paganism. Paganism started in the year 158. The Roman Empire was paganism. It endured 666 years. There's the number of the man, the prophecy, which the Pope would come from. This is what the Apostle John is describing in Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. It endured 666 years, ended in 508 B.C. Paganism ended. Through the great powers controlled by paganism, controlled by paganism for 666 years, and the papacy, 1884 Great Controversy, page 276. It's beautiful. You should read the whole chapter. However, from the year of, uh, from the year, <coughs> from the year of 538, I mean, excuse me, 508, we had 30 years. We had 30 years later, we come to the year 538. Okay? Brings us down to Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, 538. This papal system endured 1260 years, received a deadly wound in the year of 1798. He was cast into prison and died a year later. These are your references. Okay? This is what you've been receiving year after year, month after month, repeat, repeat, repeat. Ever since the new organization came in, which is in the year of 1863 that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was named and began as a corporation. What year? 1863. And the opening of this study I shared with you in the year when all this was taking place and what was going to happen. The corporation was coming into existence. Who has been in bed with the company of Cardinals all this time. All this time, it hasn't told you anything. That's why our books have been changed. The question has risen, who has been changing our books? Who, who in the world has been changing our books, ladies and gentlemen? So therefore, this is what's referring to when you read the scriptures, okay? You're referring to the fourth empire, which is paganism. The fifth empire is the papacy, which began in 538. The Pope stood up. Your reference is found in Second Coming of Christ, 1843, page 84. 1843, Second Coming of Christ, page 82, 83, I will share a little. Let us inquire. This power, Roman pagan, would be taken away when his 666 prophetic days should end. When did it end? It ended in 508. That's when it ended. And brings us to show when those days began, and of course, when they ended. Second Coming of Christ, 1843, page 83. Focus. They must have begun when the Jewish writs, rites and ceremonies were being, for this was the sole object of paganism. Listen to what I'm going to share with us. To counter the Jewish rituals, which are the Moedims, the feast, and draw the Jewish worshippers into idolatry. So by doing away with their rituals, their Moedims, their feast, of course it would draw them into idolatry, false practices. Let me read it again. 
They must have begun when the Jewish rites and ceremonies were being, for this was the sole object of paganism, to counter the Jewish rituals, moedims, and draw the Jewish worshippers into idolatry, and to blind the heathen rites with theirs. In other words, with their pagan worship. They must have begun before Christ was born, for the great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns was to stand before the woman, the Jewish church. That was the woman, was the Jewish church. You have been taught otherwise, and it's not correct. That woman is the Jewish church. That's where everything came from. Ready to devour the man-child as soon as it was born. A. The law of Nance freed the Protestant people. B. In the year of 1588 A.D., which lasted 210 years. You may read Ezekiel 39, verse 8 through 9. I will not go to that at this, this morning. The beast was to tread down the Jews and finally be cunning. By cunning, deceit, and intrigue, destroyed the city and nation of the Jews. Then I think the fairest conclusion is that when they became connected with the Jews by league, and when they had conquered Daniel's third kingdom, which was the Grecian Empire, then, and not until then, had the Romans any part in this prophecy. And that's correct. Second Covenant of Christ, 1843, page 84. I also like to give you some homework, that you may go to the library or you can look up on your computer for further reading. And also obtain the book of Maccabees. It was in the King James Bible, but they took it out. Read 1 Maccabees and Josephus, X or 12th chapter, X 10, section 6 of his Antiquities. This agrees with the angel's statement in Daniel chapter 11, verse 23. After the league made with him, that is Romans, that is the league, Romans made with him, he shall work deceitfully and become strong with a small republican people. This league was made between the Romans and the Jews. In other words, it was ratified and carried into the effect when the Greeks under, I cannot pronounce this word, and I will try, but cheats, but chides, left besieging Jerusalem upon the command of the Romans. And as Josephus and Maccabees tell us, never returned to trouble them, the Jews, anymore. Second Coming of Christ, 1843, page 84. Please read 1 Maccabees and Josephus, chapter 12, chapter 10, section 6 of his Antiquities. As we have of late, ladies and gentlemen, shared with us many, many key points. I believe, without doubt, that it is time for us to make decisions where we want to worship. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has lied from its inception from the year of 1863. The issue in regards to tithes and offerings and 501c3, the 501c3 began in the year 2320 B.C. And it transitioned down to all these empires. By the time we come to the year 538 A.D. and transitioning, it is when the Catholic Conclave of Cardinals inserted the 501c3. And then by the year of 1947, 1950, give or take, then the Seventh-day Adventist Church accepted the 501c3, which is a law. And in this, ladies and gentlemen, we were never under a 501c3. Now remember, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as I shared earlier, is the new corporation theological church of false teachings and heirs. They removed all the prophecies of the prophet Alan G. White to suit their preconceived ideas and to take you to hell. This is what it's saying. I've done much research, much studying, and looking and viewing what's being said here. Now, when I say come out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, that means come out of apostasy, come out of air, so that you will not receive the seven last plagues, and get the original books and a good Bible or Bibles or dictionary and study for yourselves as never before. When we give this message and repeat Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 19, 
There is not going to be any church organization whatsoever. If the Seventh-day Adventist Church would have fallen, other denominations would have fallen, and come under the umbrella of the Conclave of Cardinals, which took place on October 31st, 2017. They are now, ladies and gentlemen, superseding and preparing for the coming of Satan. The Conclave of Cardinals, the Catholicism Church, is not concerned of the Sabbath. They do understand that they're the ones that changed it. There's no argument there anymore. The issue here now stands right before us. Who they were waiting for is the man, Satan, Hasatan himself. Halaleo, Halale, if I can pronounce it correct, which would be a better translation. So here, my friends, I'd like us to understand. Learn Revelation chapter 14. Learn the history of what the Bible is discussing in regards to what transition to bring us to where we're at today. Why coronavirus was released. Why the 5G process of technology is being released and releasing radiation. Now is the time to be able to walk and study with Christ. Can I hear an amen? In closing, I'd like to read from Present Truth articles. Present Truth was actually uh, prepared by Vern Bates and his Echoes of the Past. And what happened here, ladies and gentlemen, is that they had thrown this information away. But I want to uh, gently read to us. I begin page 63, I think. Uh, yeah, page 63. And I want to read just a few key points. Page 63, let call. The charts of the Jews are enclosed and they are elevated to the rank of men. The Sultan of Turkey following the march of uh, civilized nations says to the Jews in his dominions, You are free. You have my permission to build a synagogue at Jerusalem. To the Jews, this great revela revolution has been a wonderful manifestation of God's providence and watchfulness. It has made them men, citizens, a people, a nation. It has given them rank, position, power. It has elevated them to the highest offices. We have passed through the promised punishments. From these brief extracts and other testimonies, I am led to conclude that the Jews are no longer trodden down. And the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. The year 2300 days ended, and Christ our great high priest has finished his daily ministration in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. For the Gentile world clothed himself in the holy garments and shut the door of the holy place, opened the door of the most holy place, and has passed in before the Ancient of Days, bearing on the breastplate of judgment all the true Israel, and is now a merciful high priest over the household of faith. When he who sees the end from the beginning has in his condescension given such evidence of his foreknowledge and goodness as is manifested in this vision, and when I see such a person or pre-feet adaption, excuse me, of all parts of its fulfillment to the prophecy, I cannot doubt but that the closing scenes will be fulfilled with equal procession. Neither can I believe that after guarding it with such care down to the cross, he would then suffer human chronology to be so changed as to render a knowledge of, his, of its termination wholly uncertain. No, no, he knows his work better than that. Oh, that men knew better than thus to reproach him. Probation closed for the Jews, my brothers and sisters, never to be a nation again, ever in history. People like to visit the Jews, go to the synagogue, etc. But they worship Kabbalah. We're going to close now and want to thank you very much as we close. And bring to our attention that it is time now to step. I believe that we've lost a lot of time. And in this time, we graciously are being given His grace, and we are actually being filled with His Spirit and being sealed and preparing for the garner as that third angel was coming to your home.
May you be found worthy to be sealed in the book of life, which is true. Let us have a word of prayer. Let us kneel. <clears throat> Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for the messages you've given to the Philadelphia church. As we close, we ask now that we may separate and prepare for fellowship lunch. Blessed be thy holy name, your highness, Yahushua HaMashiach. And Yahshua's people said, Amen.